Hello, welcome to the Living Longer Better podcast. My name is Paul Swainson. I'm Research and Development Manager at Future Training. And joining me today are Professor Samuel Gray and Anthony Crozier, who is the Health and Wellbeing Specialist at FutureFit. Uh, good to see you both. Good afternoon. Hi. Um, now then, I'm going to uh, introduce you guys a bit more formally in a moment, but uh, to provide a bit of background to today's discussion, the, the last 12 months or so has seen a, a huge acceleration in the shift towards the value of physical activity for improving health and well-being rather than fitness per se uh, and with the NHS and social care systems under increasing pressure there will be in a more urgent need to adopt the prevention is better than cure mantra uh, and implement solutions that reduce stress on resources by improving health and resistance to disease so physical activity has got a big part to play uh, and that won't come as a surprise to most people but what does that look like at a population level how do we make it happen uh, that's far less well understood, uh, but fortunately we've got the insights of two people today who are very well placed to shed some light on those key questions. So uh, Samuel Gray has worked in public health service in England since 1972. Uh, he's an author, executive director of the Oxford Centre for Triple Value Healthcare and a director of the Optimal Ageing Programme. He received a CBE in the year 2000 and was knighted in 2005 for services to the National Health Service. And since then, Samura has gone on to develop the Living Longer Better program in conjunction with Future Training. Anthony Crozier is the Health and Wellbeing Specialist at FutureFit, as I say. He writes and oversees all of the health focused courses at FutureFit. He's got uh, 20 years' experience across both community and clinical exercise provision as a we have a practitioner within the NHS, various local authorities and the private sector. Uh, Anthony's led numerous projects, including activity interventions to address non-communicable diseases and health behaviours. And following a master's in public health, Anthony is currently studying a PhD um, to focusing on clinical exercise provision in the UK. So we're going to get some very well informed thoughts and ideas over the, the next half hour or so. Uh, to get started, uh, as we've known, uh, or as I mentioned earlier, uh, we've known for a while that physical activity has got huge benefits in terms of management, prevention of disease and improvements to physical mental well-being. Um, we see it referred to as the miracle cure and, and the magic, magic pill. Um, so that side of it, if you like, is, is kind of not, not, in, not in doubt. But in terms of how we can kind of leverage that and maximise the, the, the impact, I'd like to come to you first, Muir, and see uh, what your thoughts are on how the landscape should evolve or could evolve over the next couple of years and then and beyond. This is a dramatic time, and in some ways, COVID will move us forward in appreciating the impact of inactivity and the benefits of activity. So what we're doing in a program called Living Longer Better is now working with 18 different populations, mostly with the active partnerships, and what we're doing there is a combination of reaching all the people directly through GP information systems. And this, of course, means we've got to help all the people, everyone get online. And also thinking of ways in which we can build activity into therapy, not into prevention, into therapy. And by using GP information systems, I would see that everyone who gets long-term medication in future will be getting an exercise prescription. I'm on about six drugs for various problems. I'm fairly typical 76 year old. And I get pages and pages and pages of information about the drugs I'm taking, most of which I never read. But I get nothing, not a single word about exercise and activity. So I think what we've got to do now is to build this into the core of clinical practice, as well, of course, as working closely with Age UK and the local authorities and the gyms and fitness industry to reach the public directly. But that's what we're doing mostly at the moment, is bringing these organisations together and then building it into routine clinical practice. So it's kind of making it a, an accepted normal, normal best practice, as it were. Yes, I sometimes say, well, I'd like the GP to give me nine seconds and the nine seconds would be to say, look, uh, I prescribe you this medication, but also uh, exercise is very important. But even if the GP doesn't remember that, we've linked it up so that um, if you were diagnosed with atrial fibrillation, you'd automatically get information from the British Heart Foundation, an exercise program, and links to local gyms and fitness centers where there was somebody who knew a little bit about heart disease. That just would take place automatically. And every time you're into the pharmacist to pick up your pre-prescription, the pharmacy assistant, who probably lives in the same housing estate, would say, oh, 
how is the walking program going? Um, my husband, he thinks he might do couch to 5K. So we're going to build it in just to be absolutely routine. Uh, and Anthony, uh, from your perspective, how do you th see things developing? Yeah, similar to, to Muir in the sense of, I think, uh, what we call the fitness industry will evolve. I think we'll be looking very much more like, a, I know Muir calls it a wellness industry, but like health and well-being focused industry. Uh, there's no doubt that we're going to have to support uh, the clinical uh, care that you get in secondary care uh, and primary care as well. Uh, around exercise prescription. So I think the fitness industry will naturally evolve to take some of the stress off uh, the clinical practitioners that we already have in place in multidisciplinary teams. Uh, and I think you'll get more people filtered through into, again, um, sort of mainstream fitness, which will then develop into more health and well-being focused delivery of exercise. Um, that may involve, again, upskilling workforces that I'm sure we're going to talk about in a bit. Um, it may involve uh, setting up new intervention pathways. It, it may involve job diversification, et cetera, more community work around what we would call a, a sort of traditional personal trainer role now. Uh, but either way, I would imagine that the fitness industry is going to take some of this burden uh, that's been created due to things like COVID and all the other conditions that have been exacerbated by COVID. So not directly necessarily impacted through COVID itself, but people who've been on the sidelines with through cancer treatments, through cardiovascular disease, who've not been able to access uh, potentially rehabilitation or even just general uh, exercise programming. These people, again, have the potential to have regressed slightly and these people will need exercise prescription down the line. So I think the fitness industry really needs to be able to step up um, and evolve to help reduce this burden yeah so i think, I think it's, it's interesting that it's taken this situation unfortunately to kind of really highlight that and, and show the potential value um of, of the the industry and the professionals uh, within it um but hopefully the, you know, the overall long-term outcome will, will be positive um you touched there anthony about the uh, kind of the, the changes to the fitness industry and, and even the word fitness itself um, is, is something that's worth exploring so in terms of the terminology that's used to the industry um, just as a, as a quick aside, there was a, a social media post I saw the other week in which a, a gym owner shared that they'd removed all references to the word fitness from their website and replaced it with the words active or healthy. And they saw a 16% increase in their they? web traffic mm -hmm. over, the week, over the weekend. Yeah. Um, how true that is, I don't know. But I think the, the points is, is quite sort of pertinent. Um, that, that even that connection with, with people uh, from a consumer point of view, they are starting to relate to and, and, and connect with this idea of, of activity and health as opposed to just fitness. Um, so is, is the terminology we use within the industry, is that either part of the problem or is it uh, regardless, is it something that we need to shift and change in order to help drive this message? What are your thoughts, Muir? Well, I, I, I work in Oxford and in Oxford we've got three products. One is education, the other is the mini and the third is the English language. So I've all, been raised in language all my life coming from a different part of the UK and the way English is used differently. And it's now very clear that, that language creates social reality. And if you want to change how people's brains are wired, you change the language. And I do think that fitness and sport now have a number of negative connotations. Health is quite a good one, but there's a thing called the National Health Service, which is partly a national disease service, and that's very important. So, um, so I'd probably leave health but I do think the word wellness or well-being is a good word. And we can measure. We're looking at ways of measuring well-being on different dimensions. So I definitely think there's a place for, for moving away from the fitness industry to the well-being industry. I also, um, I don't see why, um, I mean, the word leisure, I'm, I'm going to mount my next campaign against the word leisure. And if you use the word leisure, you're bound to be lumped in with pubs and restaurants and closed at the same time as pubs and restaurants. So I think that's another word that we'll need to look at. So I think well-being is probably the single best word. I've actually written to Sport England. Um, I don't expect anything. I don't expect to take my thoughts se seriously, but I'm writing to Sport England saying that I think they need to change the name to Sport and Wellbeing England. Mm. So the yes. language is very important to, to create the, the brand. And even, even the word fitness, we find that the trainers we were working with 
with older people, they, they prefer the word resilience. Yeah, that was, that was, that was going to mention that point, actually, that uh, yeah, I've seen that a few times recently, is to, if you re replace fitness with resilience and then all the context yes. that's used in, it's, uh, it's, it sort of really sort of hammers home the, what it is you're actually trying to instill and trying to develop yes. with people. Um, think, uh, Anthony, uh, example. Yeah, I was going to say, I think th there's a few things as well. The perception around the fitness industry uh, ha has potentially in past times been quite negative from a, a healthcare provision sort of perspective. So the, obviously we've got various different ways that the fitness industry work in collaboration with the, the health industry, if you want to call it that. So exercise referral being one of them. Um, and what you find is obviously this sort of crossover of skill sets so you've got the fitness industry on one side who are very uh, focused around exercise and fitness and you've got the health sector on the other side who are focused around as, as Muir said uh, disease prevention and treatment of disease and rehabilitation and then you've got this sort of gray area in the middle and I think the key thing is I'm, I'm a fan of the word well-being I like health and well-being as Muir said there um, wellness touches on that as well uh, but I would say that for me personally, uh, we need to make sure that we can bridge that gap between what we traditionally call fitness and what is traditionally healthcare. So we've got this joint up thinking, this joint up working, this collaboration, so that the respect is mutual and that people can be referred through, as Muir was talking before, from a GP and go into a service that's delivered by current fitness professionals, but are then seen as equals in their field and their skill set as healthcare professionals who prescribe them the exercise in the first place, if that makes sense. And I think using terms like resilience, well-being, uh, sense of purpose, these sorts of things that are more probably relatable and move away from the old sort of fitness and, and PE that, think, that you think of in the past when you went to school, a lot of negative connotations linked to PE because people didn't enjoy it many, many years ago. Uh, we need to move away from that slightly and change the way we think of the industry and, and our purpose within the industry as well, I would say. Yeah, no, I, I definitely agree. Um, it's, and what you just touched on there about the, the link between current fitness professionals and the healthcare sector, I think the, the kind of collaboration between the two um, is, is a huge area to, to look at. And there's obviously a huge potential for physical activity professionals to play a role um, in this in this shift um, so in terms of where they fit into the landscape I know Anthony um, you and I sat in a ironically in a, in a gym uh, reception area a few years ago discussing potential for a school of health future fit um, in order to provide training pathways into a into a career within our industry that didn't involve the traditional route of becoming a, a gym instructor um, because we noticed more and more people that were, were interested in working with people outside the normal environments and working with people that didn't and how the traditional fitness goals of getting fit, toning up, losing weight, etc. Um, so the, the school of health is, is obviously now now a reality. So there's, there's, a, there's a huge piece of the, the jigsaw that's in place there. Um, but where 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 do the these professionals fit in? What what are the the skills, knowledge, behaviours that somebody would need in order to uh, fulfil that role effectively? Do you think? Well, for me, yeah, I, I totally agree. It was. It seems like a, a very long time ago that we sat down and had this discussion. But I think the, one of the reasons you touched on there was uh, in my past as a tutor around exercise referral, I was coming into contact with a lot of students who come through and actually say, I've done gym, I've done PT, but I don't really want to work in that field. I want to work more in a health focused area. So they want to work with people with medical conditions. So it was a case of initially for us thinking about, OK, well, this is a, a clear a gap in the market we need to look at. Can we fulfill like, Can we fill this? Can we provide uh, qualifications that will allow people to work in what we could all call traditional fitness? but have the skill set to work in health and well-being. So when we talk about that, we're talking about things like conducting healthy conversations. So whether it's a brief intervention, which is a matter of seconds through to a matter of minutes, whether that's talking behavior change and motivational interviewing in consultations face-to-face, -face, developing those sort of soft skills around dealing with patients rather than clients. So again, even the terminology we touched on there, I, I, I call people patients because of my probably NHS background whereas in the fitness industry we call people clients that in itself is something that maybe we need to address and we'll 
would shift into that health and well-being focus. Uh, other skills that we need to look at is the ability to use the right terminology around healthcare professionals. So be able to converse and use the correct terminology, whether it be hypertension rather than blood pressure or high blood pressure, or whether it be talking about public health uh, policies or interventions that are out there. Um, so again, the NHS long-term plan, being familiar with things like that. So we can truly display that we've got a knowledge of what's going on across the whole health sort of sector or spectrum, really. Um, again, I know Health Navigator is a standard that's been produced by SIMSPA recently. Uh, it's on the back of the old health trainer qualifications. And the key thing there is, as Muir was saying, directing people to uh, places of care that can be uh, supportive for their journey, whatever it may be, whether it's an exercise journey, whether it's a smoking cessation journey, whether it's a nutritional based uh, and, and making sure that as health professionals, as an umbrella term, we're aware of everything that we can do to support people, not just fitness professionals, where we think gym, where we think isolation, uh, fitness is a one, one sort of trick pony sort of area. Uh, that would be my opinion. No, that is helping you. Is, is that how you would see uh, physical activity professionals and our, our sector? Uh, when I say our sector, I mean the traditional fitness industry um, being able to meet, meet that demand? Yes, well, of course, uh, professions are always difficult to deal with. I once tried to change the whole professional structure of the UK, um, you know, psychologists and psychiatrists, for example. And then I read there's only one rule of war, never invade Russia. Never tried to end it's impossible. So we've got all these 19th century professions. And of course, physical training really started in Oxford about 1859 with Florence Nightingale and remedial gymnastics was in the army very strongly. And then physiotherapy and remedial gymnastics evolved. And uh, my mother was a PT teacher and she had the word hygiene on her badge, hygiene and physical education. So uh, we do need to see there is a group of professionals whose primary training is about physical education in the broadest sense of the term. And they're different from physiotherapists. Physiotherapists are much more in working in teams. But it's clear to me that that professional group um, has a major contribution to make. And we need to rebrand what they're doing and rebrand the industry and probably shift some money I mean, we spend 18 billion pounds a year on drugs. So I think we should start campaigning to switch 100 million pounds from the drug industry to the, the activity industry. And the, the Department of Culture, Media and Sport should be campaigning for that. And I think the drug companies would quite welcome that. Because if you give people just a drug, many of them feel unwell, not so much because of the side effects, but because of anxiety. But if you give them a drug and activity, then they feel much better. So I think we should have some, uh, it could be UK Active and Sport and Sport and Wellbeing England. We need some high level aim, and that is to switch some resources from particularly the drug, the drug uh, budget into the activity budget. Because you guys could do a lot with 100 million pounds a year. And that would mean a drug spend of 17.9 billion as opposed to 18 billion. I mean, it's quite a big sum of money. Yeah, indeed. Um, I was going to say, Paul, yes. just, just jumping in on that, the, the in interesting thing to think about is I'm not, I'm not at any point in time saying, like Muir mentioned physiotherapists, we've got clinical exercise physiologists, we've got all what we class as sort of secondary care, acute skills, multidisciplinary teams. At no point are we looking at competing or like trying to have the same sort of skill set of those people. But what we need is we need a clear pathway from rehabilitation treatment in the sort of clinical sense into probably community provision that sort of prolongs that and takes that into the community and allows people to continue on their journeys rather than in certain conditions that we've got in the UK, uh, this sort of they get some initial rehabilitation, say post-stroke, for instance, and then you find that there's very limited sort of exercise prescription uh, care after that because we've got very limited resource in that area. So scope of practice is key. We still need to work within our field. We still need to be able to 
uh, provide what we provide and not tread on other people's toes. But what we need to do is build this rapport, this trust with the healthcare sector to create these sort of seamless pathways of care that allow both sets of skill set, the, the clinical skill set and the more, again, I don't want really to use the word fitness, but more exercise focused skill set um, combined in the, in the areas that it should be used. Uh, as we know, a physio is brilliant they've they've got all the skills around rehabilitation but they've not necessarily got the exercise training that a clinical exercise physiologist has Uh, they're brilliant but they're clinical so what we've got in our industry is more community-based exercise knowledge so we need to sort of try and find a way of of combining these sort of skill sets into a pathway uh, and stay in our lanes but at the same time uh, enable us to work together and collaborate and that's where we will develop a, a healthcare system where there's trust in both sectors, uh, which is something that we still lack even to today from many years. What we're trying to do is, and it's interesting you use the, the metaphor of seeing the lanes, the, the key, the, the 20th century was the century of the bureaucracy. The 21st century is the century of the network. So we're building networks. And... You, you need things like active partnerships and local governments and private gyms, but they are linear structural organizations that employ people. And what we're trying to do is, to, is too complex for any structural reorganization to achieve it. So what we see is the need for networks. And as I say, we've got about 20 million of the population now covered by networks. And mostly through the active partnerships I would say the industry we used to call the fitness industry is very closely involved as a key key nodes in that network. Yeah, definitely. I totally agree. Totally agree. It's, it's about, rather than putting money into individual services, in my opinion, it's about to trying to get make these services work together to find the, the greater good, as it were. So Yeah, it might, be, it might be quite different in Barnsley than Rotherham for exactly. reasons of history, geography and politics. Yeah, it's not one one size fits all, is it? It's very much based on, and again, this is this was well. You'll correct me if I'm wrong, Muir, but one of the reasoning behind the shift into clinical commissioning groups was potentially so that people who were involved in those were more in touch with what was going on in the health of their local area and their local regions, as it were, rather than just a, a one size fits all sort of approach to funding and everything that went with it, but. Uh, but... Yeah, but the, the, for, since 1990, there's been a belief the market will solve these problems. Mm. But uh, Oliver Williamson got the Nobel Prize uh, in 2009 for showing that the market is too complex for a market. Um, we have to work together to meet the challenge of population aging or COVID. It's yeah. a, a different approach. You cannot manage this by regulations, contracts, specifications, inspections. Is too complex for that, which is why it's very interesting to work in the field. Yes, and on the on the topic of uh, population aging, it's going to take a, a slight tangent. Uh, so the the COVID nineteen pandemic it obviously has highlighted the importance of improving, maintaining uh, health and well being into later life to, to boost resilience uh, to illness. Um, now the concept of living longer and better forms the basis of uh, much of your work, Muir. Yeah. Uh, and as part of your partnership with uh, with Future Fit, we've now got a course specifically designed to help uh, or enable health and wellbeing professionals and fitness professionals to support people to do just that, the yep. longer better. Um, so do you want to say, tell us a bit about what your thinking was behind developing the, the course itself? Well, uh, this uh, there's, a, there's a revolution taking place, and part of it's a knowledge revolution. That we now know that the normal ageing process is not the cause of major problems until the late 90s. The problems we face in societies like ours are due to loss of fitness, starting about the age of 22 with the first desk job in the car, disease complicated by accelerated loss of fitness, uh, usually due to other well-intentioned people taking tasks away from you, and and negative thinking. So loss of fitness, disease, and negative thinking. And then we now have evidence that at any age and with any number of long-term conditions, people can improve their ability levels. So that's what we've been doing. And we're doing it through networks uh, and reaching all the people directly themselves. So uh, the cultural revolution is needed because everyone assumes that people in their 80s and 90s 
need care, namely having things done for them. I think they need to be enabled. And I, I love the word coaching, closing the gap between potential and performance. They need coaching to regain the confidence to, to do things and to do things in different ways. A friend wrote me about her father and she said, oh, you're, my father's taken up your challenge, Muir. He's 94 and he's now standing up for the first time and he stays standing up and you can sponsor him for five, five pence a minute and he's raised 550 pounds. But he's going to move on to standing up from the chair five times. I said, I'll give another 30 quid if he can stand up five times. So uh, I think that, that what it would be nice for him to do would be to do that as part of a group um, online. So that's why we're interested in online or to go walking online or cycling online in a group, raising money for a good cause and competing with other groups. I'm very interested in Rotherham competing with Barnsley and Doncaster. I think that would really be the motivator for many of us. Um, and you can always find rivalries that you could use. So it's uh, a new paradigm, as they say. Uh, yeah. Uh, and I, I think a key point that I quite like is that the idea it's not about living longer in itself. It's about living better in the years that you do have. I yes. mean, a healthy life expectancy. Yeah, healthy life expectancy. Reducing that period of time you're, we all dread where you're a bloody nuisance to your nearest and dearest. <laughs> Uh, on that note, um, Anthony, do you want to do, as the writer of the course, do you want to just give us a brief overview of what the, what the course covers? Yeah, so yours touched on quite a lot of it, to be honest. It focuses on um, the effect of ageing and how we need to be more resilient, that word that we used before, uh, how it's not necessarily uh, the loss of ability, it's potentially the loss of resilience that means that uh, you will find... Uh, life more challenging is a good word obviously you've got the complexity of disease uh, some things we can avoid some things we can't but at the same time again as Muir touched on there if we have this greater level of purpose and resilience uh, the idea of moving more whether it's classed as physical activity whether it's more specific structured exercise can enable you to improve your quality of life and as you touched on there Paul the title says it all. It's not about living longer. It's living longer better. So it's quality of life, less time spent in care homes, less time spent in uh, facilities that take away your independence. So it's hard to, these are all like sort of woolly terms that we use, but it's hard to necessarily put a value on the ability to keep people uh, in their homes, looking after themselves, doing their shopping, making their food, walking up their stairs, compared to having to shift them into uh, adapted living environments, care environments. And obviously there's a fan financial burden that comes with all of those things. So the course is very much written along those lines. It talks about uh, how to communicate. So communication is a big one. It talks about motivation. It talks about behavior change. It talks about fitness and the different levels of how we think of fitness and how we need to think of fitness. So resilience, um, strength trainings in there from a, a functional point of view. So from activities of daily living point of view. Um, and then obviously dealing with some of the complexities of disease just touched on as well. Um, I think the key thing for me, the, the big take home for me is that it's trying to upskill and educate what we class as our health and fitness professionals now into really realising that we have got an ageing population and that we do need to be able to converse and work with these people over time because we're going to come across more and more of them. And again, COVID exacerbates this even further because it affects people who've got medical conditions traditionally and it affects older populations more so the younger sort of healthier inverted commas, inverted commas populations so we need to be able to work with these people yeah so that's, i think all, all the skills and the, the knowledge um, that you've just talked about there kind of relates to the the wider discussion that we've had about uh, about well-being training and education for, for the existing uh, the existing industry and the workforce within it so it's definitely something to get involved with uh, for anybody watching and listening that's uh, that's uh, kind of think, been thinking about it and um, this is this is going to be the future um, of the industry I think um, in terms of some concluding thoughts then just to, to help us wrap up um, you know, I'll come to you first so if I was to ask you where would you like us to be in the next five years or so um, what would you say but I think what we see at the moment is what we might call the inverse gym law. 
the use of gyms is inversely related to the potential for benefit. So I would like to see 10 or 20 times as many people age 60 plus in contact with a trainer and probably see an increase in the number of trainers aged over 62, but there's intergenerational work is very important. So I'd like to see a dramatic shift in the industry and I'd like to see the NHS recognize that uh, what we're currently calling the fitness industry is a well-being service that it is in its interest that we shift some public money from NHS to the well-being industry. So that's what I'd hope we'd see. Okay. And yourself, Anthony? Yeah, very similar. I'd like to see a lot more collaboration between what we class as uh, like gym environments or fitness environments to working out more in the community, a bit more collaboration into uh, health and wellbeing services that exist, exercise referral schemes that currently exist, uh, sport development teams that exist, um, any of these sort of what you would class as physical activity interventions. And I, I'd like to see um, teams work together and collaborate. I'd like to see better pathways between clinical care and rehabilitation into these community projects. Uh, I'd like to see people who work in the community that signpost people into services more efficiently and have the options to signpost people. So again, Muir talked about funding, having the funding in, this, in the area to support these services and make these services work really. Um, a lot more joined up thinking, a lot more collaboration and definitely a, a more diverse fitness professional workforce so that we can support that and we can uh, communicate on the levels that we need to uh, to make the health uh, healthcare service sort of take note and, and work with us uh, rather than sort of push back and, and look negatively potentially at us. Excellent. Okay, yeah, some, some great ideas there, some good positive calls to action, which seems like a, a good place for us to wrap up uh, today. Uh, so thank you, Bjorn. Thank you, Anthony. Thank you. Some really thank interesting you insights. Uh, plenty of food for thought there and uh, look forward to seeing what happens next. Thank you both. Thank you. Thank you.